Good evening. This is Wednesday. I think it's July 12th. Uh, my name is Douglas Griffin. This is my Wednesday night Bible study. We're in the book of John. Almost done. We're in John chapter 20. Uh, Jesus has been taken down from the cross and he's been laid in the tomb. Most of the other books, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, end at this chapter. Uh, but John has more to say about the disciples. Again, John was written not to convince the Jews, like Matthew was writing to convince the Jews, Luke was writing to convince the Greeks, Mark was writing to convince the Romans. John is writing to the church and saying, here's how we should act because of this. He's not trying to convince anybody. He's saying, here's what, here are the things that Jesus said and here's how the disciples responded, and here's how we should respond. And so he doesn't end with this chapter. He has one more chapter. Um, and I'm just saying, the, when you go to the end of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the, the, the resurrection chapter is the final chapter. But John says, ah, I've got a little bit more, because there's more to it than just he rose. What about our response to it? So um, he begins with the first day of the week. Uh, in John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each give a different perspective on what went on. And so I need to read all of them, because you have to read all of them in order to put it together. So he's saying it was that Ma Mary Magdalene went early to the tomb. If you read um, Matthew, because it implies that the women, well, I'll just read it. Okay, Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, this is the Mary, the sister of Mary, Jesus' mother. Her name is also Mary. So that's the other Mary. She's the mother of James and John, when they talk about the other Mary. So it says, uh, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to, see the, came to see the tomb. I will tell you now that there were other people there. Uh, but if you look at it this way, uh, three or four people may have approached you at the grocery store, but only one of them spoke to you. One of them said, hey, I want you to sign this petition. So when you tell the story, you might say, so this... This uh, guy came up to me and said, hey, I want you to sign this position, and you don't remember the other three people there because they, didn't, they never said anything. Only one person spoke. So when you tell the story, you just mentioned the one guy who came up to you. Someone who's more visual may describe, yes, this guy came up with me with three other people. Uh, even though they didn't speak, you remember them, people who are more audio might just remember the one person who said something. So when, when you read these accounts, there are actually at least four women who are there, but you'd have to read all the accounts in order to put that together. So in Matthew, it mentions Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. J John just mentions, well, okay, Mary Magdalene. Uh, the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord had descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. So everybody felt the earthquake, but they didn't know what it was about until Mary Magdalene gets there. And there's an angel sitting on top of the stone that has been rolled away uh, because they would dig a hole in a cave. Well, they would create a cave and then they would dig. If you went down like five steps, there's the tomb and all the rich people had their loved ones buried in a cave and they put a big stone over it so people would not rob the grave or bury their uncle joe on top of it uh if you just buried somebody in the ground people would just walk over you they might dig you up and say we want to use this space so the rich people they got to bury them in a, in a cave and that's where jesus was buried because joseph of arimathea and uh nicodemus went and got his body and made sure they buried in Joseph Arimathea's grave that he had set aside. So the angel of the Lord is sitting on top of this rock, and it says his countenance was like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. So they'd all fainted because suddenly there's an angel sitting on top, right? 
So Mary Magdalene is there coming after the stone has been rolled away. And in, in Matthew's county, uh, in Matthew's accounting of it, the other Mary's there. It says, the angel answered and said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. The soldiers were all fainted. He's not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the, no, for he's risen as he said. So the angel invites them at that point. Come see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly. So after you see it, where he used to lay, he doesn't lay there no more. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. So here's, here's the message. He is risen. Now, I, I said this to a, a friend the other day. I think it is very significant. The most important sentence in the history of mankind is he is written. He is risen. Well, he is written. Bless my heart. He is risen. And he wrote about it. And he written it. No. So he is written. That's the gospel message. It is so interesting that God chose women first to give this, to be the ones to carry the gospel message. I know that women aren't, aren't some denominations believe that women aren't preachers or something, but mm -hmm. it is so interesting that the most important message was given to women first. The angel could have showed up at Peter's house, John's house, Thomas, any of them said, hey, he's risen. Uh -uh. I'm waiting for these women to get here. And I'm going to tell them and tell them to go deliver it. It's really interesting. Uh, and as you see the story unfold, you'll see that like God was playing hide and seek with the male disciples. He'd be there for the women and then when the guys would show up, he'd be gone. And then when another woman would show up, he'd be back. And when the guy showed up, he'd be gone. It's like, nope, I just want the women to carry this message. Uh, yes, well, the, well, yeah, because there's an angel on top. Uh, but the women could stand it. The men couldn't stand it. Ah! Who's an angel? <laughs> okay. So go quickly and tell this disciple, he is risen. Most important words. Every, all, of, all of his human history is based on how, what you believe about he is risen. Okay. From the dead. And indeed, he's going before you into Galilee. Two-part message. He's risen, and he's going to go before you into Galilee, and there you'll see him. So behold, I have told you, and done. So. In Matthew, it says, they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples the word. Here's how Luke describes it, Luke chapter 24. Now remember, Matthew said it was Mary Magdalene and Mary, Jesus' aunt. Okay. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices. I don't know who the they were, and certainly, uh, which they had prepared. But they're, they're going to, it's been three days. They wanted to do it as soon as he was taken out from the cross, but it was now the Sabbath. I mean, it was now a Sabbath day, which is what they considered the Passover, a Sabbath day, a holy day. So we can't do it. We have to wait till the, it's all over. The festivities are all over, and then we can go back. So they're, they're there, and then the next day was the actual Sabbath. So they had to wait until the first day of the week. They've got their spices. They've tried to prepare Jesus' body. They're, they're ready to unwrap him. It's going to take hours to unwrap him. It says, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So they went in. Uh, if you read Matthew's version, it seems like they didn't go in because he doesn't specify. But uh, Luke says, yes, they went in. And it happened they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. So this is inside the tomb. So he doesn't mention the angel on top of the tomb. He mentions that when they go into the tomb, there's two men standing there, two angels, right? Stood by them. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? This is the angels talking to them. He's not here, but he is risen. So that's the message. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee? So when you guys were in Galilee, Jesus gave this message to everybody. I'm going to rise from the dead. He said that back in Galilee before you guys came here. You, Jesus has been there since uh, Passover, since Passover is for six months. No, not since Passover, since the Feast of Tabernacles. He's been there since October, and now it is about March, April, that time, so about six months he's been in Jerusalem. Before that, he was in Galilee, and that's when he said, 
for the final time, I'm going to rise from the dead. So remember I told you back in Galilee, and he said, meet me here in Galilee. Well, now he's saying, go back to Galilee. So the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day he'd rise again. Remember he said that? Uh, verse 8 in, in Luke. And they remembered his word. Oh, that's right. He said all that because no one was expect. Jesus said this, and they went, la, 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 la. I hear what you're saying, Jesus, but I, I'm not taking it in. Luke chapter 24. Verse 9. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene. So he tells you who it was. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna. So at least Luke mentions that Joanna was there. And Mary, the mother of James, that's James and John, and the other women with him and told these things to the apostles. And the words seemed to them like idle tales and they didn't believe them. Here's Mark's version. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, brought spices. So he mentioned Salome. So you, we know for sure it's Mary Magdalene. We know for sure that it was Mary, the mother of James and John. This is Jesus' aunt. We know for sure Salome was there and Joanna was there. So there's four women that named, but no one book named all four of them. They just said, and this one and some other women. Like they weren't important. And yet Jesus chose to give them the message. God chose to give them the salvation message. But it's like, yeah, some women, and they told them these things. But, you know, it was like, no, this is important. Why did God pick them? Okay, that they might come. Not just because, well, they were the first ones there. But God, the angels could have appeared anywhere. They weren't confined to the tomb. Jesus wasn't there. So the angels could have showed up at any point, any place, and said, hey, wake up. He waited for the women because he wanted the women to be the first ones to have the message. So it's important who they were. Uh, God thought it was that important. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. He doesn't mention the angel. But in Mark it says, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Now he only mentions one person. Luke says there was two people. There were two people, but again, only one angel spoke. So they said, ooh, the angel said, blah, 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 blah. And so uh, Mark just writes down, there was one person there because that's the only one who spoke. But there were two angels. Um, but he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. Well, he is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter. And that's funny to me. Because uh, disciples were in one place. Peter's in a different place. John's in a different place. Okay that he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So first they didn't say anything to anybody until they got to the disciples. So here's this actual, if you put all of the accounts together, uh, Mary Magdalene met them there. She got there before them. That's why in John it says she got there early. Then the other women met her there, so she went separately, so she has a separate journey. They see the angels, they see the tomb is empty. Mary Magdalene leaves. Mary Magdalene does not go inside the tomb and hear this message. The other women go in, and they hear the message from the angels. So Mary Magdalene doesn't know what happened to the body. So she has a, so Jesus actually will have to appear to her separately and say, hey, guess what? Because she's think they've stolen the body. The body's, got, the, the body's gone. The angels tell the other women, nope, he's risen. They didn't steal the Bible. So they have a different message to deliver than Mary. Mary Magdalene has a different message. She came there separately. She leaves separately. The women are the ones who go. The other women, Joanna, Salome, Mary, the mother of James and John, they go in. And again, these women have been following Jesus from the beginning. So it wasn't just 11 disciples. It was a whole group of people who were following. There was at least 70 people who were following um, Jesus. But because of the cultures that they were going to, Jesus says, let me talk to these men and really focus on them. Because as you can see, even from the description, they were discrediting the women. So let me speak to these men and make sure they carry the message out there because there are a lot of places that women won't be allowed to speak. There are a lot of places that these, not because God has ordained it, there's nowhere in the word 
that says, and don't let women go in here, and don't let women go in there, and make sure the men dance together, and the women dance together, and make sure. That was just their culture, and God's aware of our cultures. So uh, he's saying, this is how your culture is set up. I'm going to go find these people, and because that's how your culture is set up. But that's not how I'm setting it up. I don't see uh, um, a, a male or female. I'm going to tell the women first, uh, and I want that to mean something to you. So, so anyway, I want to follow this Galilee thing because that was one of the main things. Tell them that I'm going to meet them in Galilee. Why didn't Jesus want them to stay in Jerusalem? That's where he was crucified, in Jerusalem. That's where the cross was. That's where Mariah was. Why was it so important to meet him in Galilee? Okay, so from the beginning, if you look at uh, Matthew chapter 4, Verse 18, it says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. So Peter and Andrew are brothers, James and John are brothers. These are the first four disciples that were called. They were called in Galilee. Eleven of the twelve disciples were from Galilee. Um, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but he went up to Galilee and called the disciples because they were more receptive. Um, they had been neglected. That area had been neglected, and, and areas that were, that, where you see blight and people have been neglected, those actually areas are more receptive to the gospel. They know they need a savior. Um, there are a lot of cities, I was talking to a friend about Detroit and how it's been abandoned, and he was like, well, <laughs> that's what, he didn't, he didn't, it seemed like, well, that's what they get, and you know, and they've made a bunch of mistakes. And, but we're not supposed to look at these cities that way. We're not supposed to look at these poor areas that way. We're supposed to look at it like that's a place that's ripe for the gospel because they know they're a mess. It's those very rich areas. That's why God said, blessed are the poor in spirit and the pure of heart. In fact, that's what he's about to give. He's about to give the, the Sermon on the Mount was preached in Galilee. Cause, and that's where thousands of people were together. Jesus had the hardest time in Jerusalem. He had the hardest time in Bethlehem where all the Pharisees and where all the religious institutions were and where the temple was because they thought they knew more than Jesus. So I want you to meet me in Galilee because I'm going to be preaching there again. So back in Matthew chapter 4, he's by the Sea of Galilee. He calls them in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 says, And Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. It was a long time. It was six months before Jesus ever came down uh, for Passover to Jerusalem. And only did that because that's the law. You ha he had to come every year for Passover. Uh, but he spent all of his time in Galilee. In Matthew chapter 5, it says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to a mountainside and sat down, and the disciples came to him and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the, right? The Sermon on the Mount, the all, the all Beatitudes, that happens in Galilee. Those people, there's hundreds of people there. They want to hear Jesus. These were the people that they make they make fun they made fun of Jesus because they thought he was from Galilee like oh you're from Galilee bro. and God's like no those are the people that are really going to be receptive in fact when I'm resurrected I'm going to go back to Galilee because these people in Jerusalem they're crazy Matthew chapter 16 verse 13 says when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi he asked his disciples and who do the people say the Son of Man is well some say you're Elijah and some say you're this and some say okay now he's there he's at Peter's house. This is, he goes from there to Galilee and has this experience in, in Matthew chapter 17. It says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. So we know that this, this mountain in Galilee is where uh, the transfiguration takes place. He says, there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. He gives them a preview of his transfigured body. Uh, here's what's going to happen after the resurrection. They get a preview of it, but don't tell anybody, Jesus tells them, until the resurrection, when I meet you back here. Matthew chapter 17, verse 22. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the same chapter as the, resur as the transfiguration, the Son of Man is going to be delivered be delivered into the hands of men. He's telling everybody this. So they come out the mountain, Peter, James, and John, and Jesus. He comes down off the mountain. Everybody's gathered there, all the women, the men, because the women heard all these words as much as the men did. They're right there listening, just the same as the men. And all these people from the Galilee area that Jesus had been healing and preaching and talking to, 
he's talking to all of them when he says the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he'll be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. The women heard it also. That's why when the women go into the tomb, the angel says to them, remember when he said this? And they went, oh, yes, that's right. We were there just like the men were there. Um, in Mark chapter 14, um, on Jesus' last night uh, before he's crucified, verse 25, it says, When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And he says to them, the very next verse, You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now, it's written. Uh, here's, uh, the shepherd's going to be st struck and the sheep are going to scatter. He says in verse 28, uh, verse 28, 28, yes. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. So just three days before this, Jesus had already had said the very same words again. You're all going to fall away. But after I've risen, I'm going to go ahead of you into Galilee. So that's why the angels reminding them, tell them to go to Galilee. That's why the angels remind the people once they get into the tomb. So on the rock, go to Galilee. In the tomb, tell them to go to Galilee. That's where I'm going to meet them. I'm going to go before you into Galilee. So um, this is why they did not go to Galilee. They just stayed in Jerusalem because something's wrong with them. The women delivered the message to the men. that the, Here's what the angels said. Didn't, didn't do it. Finally, they do go to Galilee after Jesus pops into the room where they are in Jerusalem and says, hello, I'm working here. And then they finally go to Galilee. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 16, it says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Now, first they go to the Sea of Galilee. They don't go to the mountain. But Jesus had said, meet me back in this mountain. Which mountain? The Mountain of Transfiguration. That's not the name of the mountain. It's practically actually probably Mount Tabor where uh, Deborah told Barak to go in order to fight off the whichever ites with their Amorites, where Gideon fought his ites, his whatever ites, and, and uh, on Mount Tabor up in Galilee, that area in the Galilee area. Same mountain. I'm going to meet you there. This is the mountain where I saw all those people. This is the mountain where I, where I preached the uh, Beatitudes and all of that in Galilee. I got my biggest audience. So they finally go to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worship him, but some doubted, not the disciples, some of the people. Like, is that really the same guy? Can't believe it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says to them in verse 5, and that he appeared to Cephas, he appeared to Peter, then he appeared to the twelve, and kind of in order, Jesus appears to, to Mary Magdalene. This is Jesus appearing, not the angels. And yes, the angels talked to Mary Magdalene, and the women, but Jesus appears, he makes like nine appearances or something like that. He appears to Mary Magdalene, he appeared to the women, then he appeared to Peter, then he appeared to the twelve disciples, just simply to tell them, go to Galilee. Then he appeared to the twelve disciples again, go to Galilee. Uh, so after that, he says, he, so Paul says he appeared to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Where? In Galilee up on that mountain where he had fed the 5,000, most of whom are still living, Paul says, though some have fallen asleep, but all these people witnessed him. So after the disciples finally, and again, he's only appearing to the disciples to remind them to go to Galilee, even though the angels sent the message, the women told them, they're like, nah, we're not believing it, until Jesus finally showed up. Go read my lips. So they finally go to Galilee so that he can appear to all these people, and he preaches to all of them and gives them the great commission to all those people, the 500 people. Okay, anyway, so back to Mary Magdalene. She's by herself. John says that she went early. The other women meet her, we know. It was Joanna, Salome, was Mary, the mother of uh, James and John, and who else, who knows who all else was there, because the, the men who wrote this just didn't think it was important to mention their names, but God thought it was important enough to be there. So while it was still dark, it says Mary Magdalene went there in, in verse 1. Verse 2 says, uh, uh, come on. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter. So she sees the angel. She sees that the stone has been rolled away. And 
uh, she doesn't actually hear the message. So let me go back to, I just want to get it right, how John describes it. Uh, she went while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she just leaves. The disciples tell the women, it's okay, go inside. Joanna, Salome, Mary, the mother of James and John, they go inside. Mary Magdalene just thinks they have stolen the body. I can't believe it. So uh, she doesn't have the message yet. She, the, the women have been told he is risen. She's not been told that yet. So then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. I have to just park there for a second. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. This is the first time that John acknowledges, normally he says just to the disciple whom Jesus loved. He spoke to Peter and to the disciple, but he says, and to the other. And that word other, this one means other of the same kind. You know, like I gave you a banana and you say, give me another fruit. But you don't, you mean another of the same kind or another of a different kind? No, the same kind. I want another banana. Uh, so the other disciple, just like me, whom Jesus loved. But the word he uses is for love is phileo. Every other time he's talking about just himself and the disciple whom he loved laid on his breast. And the disciple whom he loved, he said, take my mother and go to the... At this point, he always uses agape, which is more of a love. It doesn't mean I was told over and over. That means the God kind of love. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean that. But that's how God loved the world. God so loved the world, God, that word is agape. But they use agape for a lot of things. It doesn't mean, it's not only applied to God, but it's, an, it's a familial love. It's an, an affectionate love. Uh, um, but it's not like love of a friend. It's, an, it's in a higher plane than you would love your friend, like you love your family. So that's how the love, that's the word that he always uses for Jesus loving him. In this case, when he says the other disciple whom he loved, he uses phileo because <laughs> later on it's going to come up when, when Peter's at the uh, seaside, he's just going to keep saying, do you phileo me? Well, you know I agape you. Do you phileo me? Well, you know I agape you. So it, it's, it becomes a thing. We'll get into that later. But so John is just making the point. Jesus loved him like phileo. That's the kind of love that they had where with me it was agape. So he came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus phileoed. Okay, so, but they were not together. They, John is at his house. John is with Jesus' mother. Peter is at his house. So it says, she ran and came to Simon Peter, and, and, the, and, the, and you look in the Greek, I mean the Hebrew and all that stuff, they, they tell you that the other disciple, it implies that he went somewhere else. They were not together. So she, first, she goes to Peter, she goes to John, tells him separately. And he says to both of them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. Now, Peter's actually, I'm sorry, Peter's not at his house. Uh, Peter's with some of the other disciples. John is at his house. Because, um, you know, Peter's house is up in Galilee. But anyway, but they're, they're not together. But he tells them separately. It says, and we did not know, we don't know they've taken him. You know, she just sees the empty tomb. She didn't hear any of the message from the angels. So, that's, so they hear this separately. In John chapter 20, verse 3, it says, Peter therefore went out. And the other disciple, and we're going to, so they both leave their, where they are separately. They're, I'm sure they're near each other. They're with, you know, there's a particular part of town where everybody lived. But they leave separately, and then they meet together, and they were going to the tomb. Um, Luke only describes Peter going because they went separately. In, P in Luke chapter 24, verse 12, it says, But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths. So they, because they, the, the disciples that Peter was with, saw, they just saw Peter leave. So when they tell the story, they didn't see John leave. John saw himself leave, so he, I'm going to tell the story and make sure that I'm in it. So when John tells the story, yes, he went to Peter, but she also came to me separately. And we met up. Okay, so, because um, in verse 24 of Luke 24, when they came back, they were together. So it says, and certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, certain of those. So even though earlier he said only Peter went, 
It says, certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. Uh, but him they didn't see. They didn't see Jesus, but they, found, they just found an empty tomb. So they came back and told us. So we know that they were together at the tomb, but they, they went separately. In John chapter 20, verse 4, it says, so they both ran together. Even though they left their houses separately, they met up. Ooh, oh, my God, they've taken this tomb. Let's go investigate. And they're scared because if they broke into the tomb and stole the body of Jesus, what are they going to do to them? And especially, they just crucified Jesus, and we're his followers. So they had to kind of discuss this. Should we go check this out? I don't know because they're crazy. They killed him, and now they stole his body so they can pretend, you know, what, they had no idea what was going on. So they get together, and they, they run together. And the other disciple outran Peter, and John is talking about himself, and came to the tomb first because John is younger than Peter, uh, maybe 10 years younger than Peter. John is, uh, which is why John lived so long. That's not why he lives long, but he, he's, he's writing years after Peter and Paul are already uh, killed. John's still around because he's a, he's a little bit younger than all of them. So he's outrunning him not because he cared more, just because he's a little younger. Verse 5, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. John's talking about himself. Peter finally gets there, <laughs> out of breath. Then Simon Peter came, following him. John wants you to know I got there first because Luke didn't even mention that I went there. I'm kind of mad. Uh, so I want everybody to, I'm correcting the record. Then Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there. So John's saying, Peter gets all the credit because he actually went in. I stopped, and, and what he, he can see the linen clothes, but he can't see the, the handkerchief that was on Jesus' face because it's farther away, and you actually have to go down into the tomb. Like I said, it's like five or six, seven steps down that you have to go, and then in order to see everything. So John just can stoop down. He can see the linen cloths. Um, now, it says he saw the linen clothes lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. So let's talk about this wording. Um, so uh, the linen cloths that had been around Jesus, one reason w why it's there, it takes a long time to, because it takes a long time to wrap Jesus' body. It was going to take the women a long time to unwrap his body and then put the spices on it that were going to preserve it so it doesn't decay as fast. Because uh, they're again not remembering that he had said in Galilee, I'm going to rise from the dead. They're not remembering that. So they're on their way to, to do that. One good thing that for Peter, for John, he's thinking, why would they steal his body but, but take an hour and a half to unwrap it? Like, that doesn't make any sense. They would just take the body. They, why would they unwrap it? So to, to, to John, that meant something. Like, I don't know that anybody stole his body. Because that isn't. So, because uh, in John chapter 11, remember when Lazarus has been, had been wrapped up. John chapter 11, verse 43, says, Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Verse 44 of John 11. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. So it's a separate cloth on the face but it's still wrapped. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. And because Lazarus couldn't get out himself. You, if you were tied, it's like a, a straight jacket or something. They, they have your arms wrapped. You couldn't get out yourself. People would have to help you. And it was like a thing, like we have to all help unwrap this guy. Um, they didn't wrap your feet so he could, he was hopping out, but that was it as far as he could go. So they see the, bandages there that they had wrapped the linen they had wrapped him in and for John it's like huh it looks like he just came out of them that's how it would that's how they would look they would just be in a pile if you would just came out of like if you just went right through the sheets of your bed the bed would then just be there the sheet would just be there like you left it um so to John, it looked like, well, Jesus came out of those things. Um, that's not what it meant to Peter, though. In John chapter 20, verse 8, it says, Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. So he went in after Peter. 
But he says he went in and saw and believed because, okay, Jesus came out of this. He came out of those. That's the only reason why it would look like that. Uh, they, they, they would not have unwrapped him. He, he, he came through those bandages as though, let me take these off and I'm going to put on my new clothes. Um, and it says he believed. He's clear that Peter did not. John's probably thinking about the verse in Psalm chapter 16, verse 9 and 10. It says, therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, in hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So, so somehow someone's going to go down to Sheol where the, spir where the spirits are imprisoned there because no one can go into the presence of God. Everyone who has died, whether it's Abraham, Moses, or really bad people, none of them are in the in heaven yet. They're in a kind of a holding pattern. Unless you've been really, really wicked, then you're, you're like in the parable with Lazarus and the rich man. You're in hell. You're in torment. Abraham, you can see Abraham on the other side, and he's talking, sorry, you messed up. But none of them are in the presence of God. But he's saying, you won't even leave my, my soul in that prison world where Abraham and Moses are then. You won't let me see corruption. You're going to raise me up. And so they would hear that and go, what does that mean? So the Holy One is going to go down there, and, but he gonna get, he's going to raise up. And John, now it's making sense. These scriptures, that's all they have. I was explaining to someone today. That's all they had. They just said them over and over. They didn't have magazines. They didn't have television shows. They had books. There were no novels. There were no video games to distract them. These were the stories and the things that they just said over and over and over. And they knew them really well. Like we know lines from a movie like, uh, give her an offer that you can't refuse from The Godfather or Luke, I am your father. Everybody, we, like we can complete these lines. Uh, Here's looking at you, kid. We've heard these movies over and over, and there's this lines from old movies that we just have heard a million times. They were like this with these scriptures. So when something would happen, they'd go, oh, that reminds me of that scripture. So as soon as he sees, oh, he said he wouldn't leave my soul in hell. He wouldn't suffer any corruption. He must have rose like he said, and now it's coming back to them. But before then, they weren't expecting Jesus, even though he had said it over and over. They were not expecting Jesus to rise from the, from the dead. In John chapter 20, Verse 9, it says he believed. Now the scripture says, verse 9, for as yet they did not know the scripture. That's how the New King James translated. Better translation would be for up until that time. For as yet, it's like they still didn't know. You don't know it yet. That, the way they're using yet would mean up until that time, they did not know the scripture. They, they did not understand the scripture. Not like they didn't know it, like they hadn't heard it. He's not saying we hadn't heard the scripture, but they didn't know it enough to believe it. So up until that time, they hadn't really understood the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. At this point, they went, oh, all those things that he kept telling us, I get it now. In John chapter 2, when he first met them, John chapter 2, and I'm only going to use these quotes from John, because John put these things in there to say, well, see, we should have known. In John chapter 2, verse 18, it says, So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? And what had Jesus been doing? He'd shown up on Passover and started healing a bunch of people in the temple. So what are you doing? I'm trying to fulfill all this scripture. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Well, what sign do you show us since you do these things? What sign? Healing people? Okay. So Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. I will raise it up. So, and he's talking, and then the Jew says, it was taken 46 years to build this temple. Then he means rebuild it. Herod did a, Herod, bless my heart. Herod did a rebuilding project on the temple. Um, it had been destroyed earlier during the war of the Judas, Maccabees, and all that stuff, and they had rebuilt it. But they hadn't done a great job. For 46 years, Herod had made it the most gorgeous place on earth. People, it shined. You could see it from miles away. The temple was just gorgeous. 
46 years we've been working on this building. And you're going to, he says, and you're going to raise it up in three days? Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, it says, his disciples remembered that he had said to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So, oh, he's going to raise up his temple, which is what Jesus did. So, when he said, it is finished on the cross, his spirit left his body. The body's still hanging there. Jesus is not in that body anymore. That's his earthly body, not in that body anymore. That body's put in the temple, I mean, in the, in the uh, tomb. Jesus is not in that body. Jesus is in Sheol. He's preaching to Abraham and Moses and all of them and explaining everything and see, I'm the fulfillment of the scripture and that. that. Then on the third day, because he says, I'm going to raise up my body in the third day, Jesus went to the tomb. He went back to the tomb. He raised up his body, and it became a new body, that glorious body that they had seen on the, um, on the mountain top for transfiguration. And then his spirit went into that brand new body. So he's, so he's 100% God, and he's still 100% human. But he's in this brand new resurrected body, the one he had previewed for them. So Jesus raised up his body. It, the body went right through those bandages. That same body is going to walk through walls when he shows up in Jerusalem and the disciples are sitting there all depressed because they don't believe. He, he's going to walk through and say, hello. And they go, ah, Jesus. <laughs> and that, because that our bodies, when we get our new bodies, granny, mama, daddy, granddaddy, they've got new bodies. They, they're not bound by physical laws anymore. Right? They can walk through walls. They can just walk through anything. They're not bound by that anymore. Um, and so Jesus just called that body right through that, those bandages. That's why they, they went through there. Uh, that's why they were just laying there. And it became a new body. Um, and, and he was inside his new body. And then, he, and then he goes out and talks to Mary Magdalene. We'll find out next week with that new body. But he made sure he wasn't there when the, when the men were there. Because he'd already told the guys, I've already told you what's going on, and I'm not going to keep telling you. I'm gonna, I need you to believe. Because if I don't test your faith muscle now, how are you going to believe later when you're in prison, when they're doing this to you and that to you, and they're threatening you? You've got to believe in the invisible. So, I, I, But the women, I want them to carry the message. I want them to be the first gospel preachers. So uh, in John chapter 10, Another place, verse 17. He says, after he healed the blind man in Jerusalem, he says, therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. I'm going to raise the head body. I, I laid down my life. I laid down that body. I got right back into it after three days and raised it up again. He says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again, raise it up again. Uh, this command I have received from my father. So he called to that body. It came right through those bandages. It was that glorified body. He got in it. Uh, he's going to see Mary Magdalene next week and says, oh, don't touch me. I have to go. I haven't finished quite. I've got to go up, shed my blood in the mercy seat so I can complete the pattern that we set for you for the past 1,200 years so that when I do it, you'll recognize it. And you go, oh, see, he's completing the pattern. Now all our sins have been forgiven. So uh, now I do want to talk about this one other thing, which is the cloth that was in Jesus' head. So we know that it was separate. Even John, just peeking in, could see the cloth where his body had been. But it's not until he went and went walked down six feet down into it that he was able to look and go, oh, there's a cloth that's separate. There is a fantastic story, and unfortunately, I think it's just a story, but it's so good, I wish it was the truth, because it's so good. Because um, you say, because they described it that the cloth was folded. Um, let me go back to where uh, he, he says, then Simon Peter came, following, and he went into the tomb where he saw the linen cloth lying there, and the handkerchief, another translation could have been the cloth, uh, 
the literal translation strip is actually like sweat rag because it's it's just the sweat the work thing it's called the work thing when people with sweat they wipe their faces uh, and so that's why they sometimes translated a handkerchief or cloth it says the handkerchief that had been around her head was not lying with the linen cloth but was folded together in a place by itself the word folded is not accurate um, it was wrapped it was twisted so if you can imagine they they wrapped it it wasn't just a little cloth place over it, it it was wrapped around his head and so if jesus were to come through it it would still be wrapped because no one unwrapped it and that was the um that was the point it wasn't it was God wanted them to know his body has not been taken. No one unwrapped this. His, he came. He actually came through the bandages. It's still wrapped as though um, he just went right through it. That's why they're making this point that he his he went he went through it, and, and so no one unwrapped him. It's like impossible. They did not steal the body because. They wouldn't be able to get him out of this. Th they'd have to unwrap the whole thing, and it was not unwrapped. So it was still wrapped. They used the word folded together, but it was still the wrappings as though it had been wrapped around his face, and he'd simply gone through it. Uh, someone wrote a really fantastic, lovely story, and that, that if this story had taken place in the 600s or 700s, 800s in Europe, would have been totally accurate. In Europe they you would um when you were finished with your meal your servant in order for you to let your servant know that you were done you would just toss it your 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 handkerchief onto the table and he'd know you were done and to clear the plates but if you were going to come back for seconds you would fold it up same thing happens they ask us to do that in your hotel room they say uh if you're going to use this towel again then fold it up and hang it you know on the shower just hang it up and we won't wash it but if you want a new one then leave it crumpled on the floor of your bathroom that's way the maid comes in she'll know to come and take it that's a european thing that they just started doing in american recently so uh i mean you know the past 30 40 years whatever so um it's the same sort of tradition in europe that the aristocrats would use just in somebody's house, you didn't have a servant. In your house, you didn't have a servant. If you're just a normal person, only the aristocrats had servants. And so um, where Jesus was, first of all, he was not in Europe. This wasn't the 6th or 7th century. And the house that he was in didn't have a servant. Um, it, it's, not, it's not something that the, that the Jews did at that time. They didn't... Uh, <laughs> have handkerchiefs. First of all, they ate everything with their fingers. Um, so they would wash separately somewhere else after their meal. They didn't, they didn't have a handkerchief. This, there's nowhere in, in literature anywhere where they describe having a handkerchief at the table, having a cloth or a towel at the table. They washed before they ate, and then they, but during, you're eating with your fingers, your, your hands are getting dirty, and you just kept eating, and then, and you're lying on the on the floor, you're, right? You're leaning on the table, eating all the food with your fingers, and then when you're done, you left the table and you went somewhere and washed. There wasn't a anyway. There's just nowhere in literature, and it's such a great story because the idea was Jesus was saying, "I'm coming back, and I'm gonna." So I'm folding it up and I'm putting this napkin here because I'm coming back. It's like, oh man, that's a really great story, but I think. John is pointing it out to say no one stole the body. That was my proof. That's why I believed it looked as though he had just passed through it because it was still wrapped. It still looked like it was wrapped around a body, but that the body had just left it. So it was still wrapped like that. Same thing with his face cloth that was, that was separate. No, no one would have. Anyway, this was proof that he had risen. Not that he was coming back, although that's a great story. But this is proof that he, has, he had risen to them. John believed 
oh my God, he actually is risen. This is all true. Everything that he said, like all these scriptures finally came back to his brain. He's risen. He's risen. This is phenomenal. So there are no angels there. Uh, please know that, again, when the women went in, right after Mary Magdalene left, the angels were there and said, here's the message for the disciples. We're not sticking around to tell the disciples. We want you to tell the disciples that he is risen and to meet him in Galilee. And then they disappeared. The, John and Peter get there. There's no angels there. Because they're supposed to look at what it is and put everything together in their heads. Then they left. Mary Magdalene comes back to the tomb, as we know, next week. And Jesus shows up and talks to her. Jesus could have talked to them, but Jesus wants to get this message. He wants the women to be one to spread the gospel. I just think that's significant. I, I like people who well, women aren't supposed to preach the gospel. Then why did God give them the gospel to preach first? Which is what I call this: women first. Okay. So anyway, next week uh, we'll we'll take up with Mary Magdalene, what Jesus said to her, why he couldn't touch her. And then the women see Jesus second. So again, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, then he appears to the women, before he ever appears to the disciples. Why? Why did he appear to the women first? Clearly there's something important there. But we'll, 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 we'll deal with that next week. So thank you so much for uh, listening. Um, this Sunday I am in the book of Exodus. And uh, they just... Moses is about to come down and see what, why God was so mad. God has taught Moses intercession. And Moses is about to come down off the mountain and see that they have built uh, a golden calf. And now we're going to see if Moses still believes in all that forgiveness he was trying to get God to do. Okay, but that's on Sunday so for those of you who are listening in. So thank you, and otherwise I'll see you next week. All right, thanks. Bye-bye. Wait, how do I click off?